Well, good morning. How are you? I was a little under the weather this week, so we're going to see how my voice holds up. So bear with me this morning. But uh, working with compassion has been in the works for months and months. This is a phenomenal organization. I was exposed to them when I was a youth pastor taking students to uh, an event and they would be there and they would have people like that speak and share their testimony about how God changed their lives through compassion and someone like you and me adopting them, sending them money that allows them to eat, get education, that allows them to hear about Jesus and the gospel and the stories were always so profound. Without compassion, most likely they would not have known about Jesus. So they've done such a beautiful job building bridges is the way I see it to uh, countries and areas in the world you and I would never come across, would probably never visit, would never interact with these types of people and it allows a one-on-one connection where you can love them provide for them and build a relationship with them. I highly recommend at the very least, check out uh, the tables in there, look at the children. We have representatives here from Compassion. They've got shirts on and volunteers to answer questions. The big thing they've requested is to not take a packet with you out of the building in case they get lost or never come back. Guys, we don't wanna lose children, we wanna save children, all right? That's the goal, first and foremost. So we want to leave the packets here. You fill out the information, you make that commitment, but they stay on campus. But I hope you will check that out this morning. All right, I don't know if you've heard, but there's something going on Tuesday. Did you hear about that? Like an election or something? You want to talk politics? (laughs) Five people are leaving already. Um, Don't start chanting like a candidate's name, okay? Don't do that. But... Yeah, I've kind of stayed away from it. I've been praying about it. I didn't feel led to really preach on it. Heather and I, my wife, were talking about it this week, and uh, we were just talking about kind of the spiritual components of elections, and, you know, there's so much passion behind it. It obviously makes a huge impact. Who's in the White House? Who's governors? Who's the leadership? It's super important. I hope everybody votes and has your voice heard and all of those things. But obviously there's like trepidation, there's anxiousness and we get very passionate about it and we, and we should absolutely care because of the implications of it. Uh, but what is the spiritual mindset that we wanna have going into this week, whoever gets into the office, whoever is the leader of the country, all those different things, what's the spiritual mindset? And Heather was uh, mentioning to me, some of her and her friends were talking about this uh, piece of scripture. Now we know it's gonna be the 47th president of the United States. And she was led to Psalm 47. And it's so perfect. I'm gonna read it to you. And we're gonna feel good about where God stands overall with this stuff. And then I'm gonna pray. And then we're gonna get into the message. Sound good? Look at Psalm 47 real quick. It says, clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. For the Lord most high, if you have a Bible, you circle most high because he's above all, amen? He's above it all. The most high is awesome. The great king over all the earth. He subdued nations under us, peoples under our feet. He chose our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob whom he loved. God has ascended amidst shouts of joy. The Lord amid the sounding of trumpets, Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King, sing praises. Listen to this, for God is the King of all the earth. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. God reigns over the nations. I love it, so profound. Where does God sit? Above it all. He reigns over the nations. God is seated on his holy throne. The nobles of the nations assemble as the people of the God of Abraham. Listen to this. For the kings of the earth belong to who? Don't you love that? He's over all of it. The kings of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. So, Christian, no matter what, disagree, agree, celebrate, sadness, whatever comes this week, whatever you feel profoundly about, and I think I know what most of the people in the room probably feel, whatever you feel with that, 
we believe the scriptures, amen? God is over all. He is sovereign. His will is perfect. He's in charge. He has full control. We know that things get worse before Jesus comes and it gets better, but our trust is in God above all else. He's the king. So I want that to resonate with your heart and your mind this week. Be careful on social media. Be careful at Thanksgiving coming up, you know, all those things. But let me take a moment and let's pray for our country, all right? Would you pray with me? God, it's so important. It matters a lot. There's always consequences. There's always things that come from times like this. And obviously with the news and all the things going on, it always feels like it's more and more significant and that there's more and more on the line. But God, you are sovereign over it all. We come together today and we believe your scriptures. You are above it all. And we put our faith and our trust in you. And so we align with different political parties and with people, but we do not put our hope in a person besides Jesus Christ. Our hope, our faith, our foundation, and certainly our future, our joy, our greatest trust is in you because you are perfect. You are trustworthy. You do not lie. You do not shift your thoughts or your ideas or how you speak to us. It is perfect. So no matter what comes in this country or all over the world, may we have such a foundation of faith and trust that you are God and you are who we come under. You are who we worship. You are who we follow. You are who we put our complete faith in. And God, thank you for that. But may your will be done in this country. And above all the political stuff, may the people in politics come to know Jesus. May there be a revival of the Holy Spirit flourishing in the name of Jesus proclaimed in Washington, in the White House, in politicians, in leadership. May there be revival amongst those people so it can be as healthy as can be but we put our faith in you, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, you ready to transition? Let's go into our message this morning. Um, we're starting a series called Compassion. Everyone say compassion. It's a word maybe you hear about, uh, it's, but today what I, what I wanna do with our time this morning is give you a little bit of an introduction to that idea. We'll tell some stories in the next few weeks. We'll talk about Jesus, his compassion and what it looks like. But how many of you hate to have your reputation tarnished? Like to be misunderstood or have you ever had something that you, you did one thing in a, a certain place and that one thing is how people remember you for. Do you have any of that? Maybe something embarrassing when you were in school or something like that. You're just remembered for that one instance. Like celebrities have to be so careful. One Instagram moment and it goes viral and then that's all they're known for. And they get dropped by labels or their leadership teams or whatever. Let me, let me tell you a story, okay? And I, I'm actually proud of this, but I shouldn't be. When I was at my summer camp as a kid, we're going back in Griffin's past, all right? Sharing with you my sins. Uh, we were told at this camp, we were in this room, you know, there's like 50 kids running around, elementary age. We're just bouncing off the walls in the summer. We wanna play. And we had these like dodgeballs, kickballs. And the one thing the guy said was, hey, nobody throw or kick these balls in this room. So what do you think we all wanted to do after that point, right? It's just like an invitation for carnage, you know? And I was a nice kid for the most part, but you know, a ball in my hands and wanted to kick a soccer player, you just, it's just hard to not give into that temptation. So for whatever reason, this beautiful red ball comes bouncing perfectly to me and just soccer mode kicks in, all right? I just wanted to hit that thing as hard as humanly possible. I don't know why the, the enemy, the, the evil spirit came upon. I don't know what happened in that room, but it came and I mean, you know, any golfers in the room? You know, when you hit the ball and you don't even feel it, like you connected with it so pure, I laid into this ball, like 
head down, knee over the ball, hit it with the laces. And it was like a torpedo missile to this girl's nose, all right? It was phenomenal, okay? And if she was a goalie, it was a great save, you know, like boom, it went off. But when I hit her in the face, my eyes just was like, oh no. And I tried to hide. I was like bartering with the kid who saw me do it, like offering him Oreos to not turn me in. You know what I mean? How you do in, in summer camp. And I got in trouble. And for like that year, I was known as the boy who hit that girl in the face. But I'm a good guy. I'm a pastor now, you know, like it was in me, just Satan works in weird ways, you know? So. We don't like to be remembered for bad things or misunderstood. And I really think when it comes to God, okay, we're going to talk about the Old Testament God this morning. How do you think about him, right? If you're not a believer, maybe you've heard stories or, I mean, even if you read the Old Testament, you see like, man, God flooded the earth, right? I mean, there was so much bad that he just wiped the slate clean. It started over with one family. And you read about Egypt and and, uh, the slavery with uh, the Israelites and what he did with Pharaoh and the plagues. And and then you think about (coughs) the Israelites in the wilderness and they were sinning against God and he didn't let them in the promised land, right? Do you think about the Old Testament God as like a kind, sweet God? Or do you, what was that? (laughs) That was so weird. (laughs) I'm gonna come over here for a minute, all right? Um, We think about God as, as like this harsh, strong, judgmental God, am I right? Like when you kind of consider that God. But I think we see that he, gives judgment, there's punishment, he's a leader of the people, and of course, Israel rejects him constantly, and he's a God who's faithful, he's a God who's holy, and he shows us in the Old Testament that judgment has to come, he's a just God. But he also wants to be known by you and me in a very specific way. And so here's, here's what I want you to see, you can write this in the notes if you like, God describes himself as compassionate in the Old Testament. So my heart for you today is to know the God you worship, to fully and more so understand more about this God and how he describes himself and how he wants you and I to know him as this almighty, powerful God. He says this in Exodus 34, Verse six says, and he passed in front of Moses, this is God, proclaiming the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. So right here in the midst of Israel, going on this journey with God, They're going to encounter all these things. They're going to sin against him, the golden calf and worshiping other gods and missing him and all those different things. He comes before Moses, who is his spokesperson and his leader for the people. And he says, Moses, I am God and I am compassionate and I am gracious. I am kind. I'm loving. Even though we see throughout the Old Testament that we see his judgment. Now, God also wants us to see him as a father. Now, I want you to see, we're going to unpack this word compassion. We're actually going to go, I don't do this a lot. We're going to look at it in the Hebrew, all right? We're all going to practice this together. Where does the word compassion come from? This is fascinating. The Hebrew word is recham. You got to get that part in the back of your throat. We're all going to practice. Are you ready? Say recham. You just spit on everyone in front of you, all right? right when we're all sick, recham, okay? That's the Hebrew word for compassion, but it's tied, you see it on the screen, to the Hebrew word for the womb, which is rechem, okay? So the idea of compassion is linked to the idea of the womb, which is kind of the most intimate connection that a human being can have beyond probably marriage, this unique special relationship between a mom and this unborn child 
in the womb. Well, what does that mean? So God calls himself compassionate. And that word is tied to a baby in the mother's womb. It's the core of who we are. It's like the deepest, most inner parts of you. Now, I did not birth any children. You'd be happy to, well, I don't know why I just said that, but... Heather had five kids and uh, we think we had seven pregnancies and two miscarriages. And so we went through this a lot. It took me till the third one to appreciate what all was going on when Skylar was born. And it was just so overwhelming for me, let alone, I don't know how overwhelming it was for you, but I was struggling through it all, right? And so just thinking about how Heather felt towards these babies being formed in her body. And there's not a mother in the room that wouldn't, relate to this. There's just something different about that connection. There's something powerful about how God created women to be able to form these babies in the womb and just immediately, like right when you find out that you're pregnant, you feel that connection. It's like a different type of feeling. It's like, clearly my kids love mom more than me. I don't know how this works, right? They go to her for more. There's just this bond. Am I right? Guys, you feel that? We're secondary. I don't, I don't know what happened, but there's just this, this connection. And so God's telling us this idea of how he wants to be described, this compassion, this deep-seated inner love that he has for his people, like a mother has for a child. So he's showing us he's like a father. He's like a, a parent. And so then there's this amazing story. I just, I've never found a way to use it. I'm gonna use it this morning. We see it illustrated, this illustration of a mother's love for their child. In First Kings, when Solomon was becoming the leader of Israel, he was the man of wisdom. And there was these two women, they both had children. They lived in the same house. And one of the babies died, one of the babies lived. The other woman tried to steal the baby from the other woman. The Bible is a soap opera, it's, crazy. it's just crazy, okay? Tries to steal the baby from the woman because she's upset she lost the baby. And they go all the way to Solomon, the leader of Israel, and they're saying, Solomon, you decide who gets the baby. Like pressure's on, all right? And so here's what it kind of boils down to. Solomon heard all he needed to. He says this in 1 Kings 3. Then the king said, bring me a sword. So they brought a sword for the king. He gave then an order, cut the living child in two and give one half to one and one half to the other. Now, obviously he wasn't gonna do this, but what is he doing? He's testing the hearts of the moms, of the women. The woman whose son was alive was deeply moved, that is also a term tied to compassion, deeply moved out of love for her son and said to the king, please, my Lord, give her the living baby. Don't kill him. But the other said, neither I nor you shall have him. Cut him in two. In verse 27, thankfully the king gave this ruling, give the living baby to the first woman. Don't kill him. She is the mother. And we have that story, one for Solomon's wisdom, but it's an illustration again, of the compassion a mom has for a child, compassion that a father has for his children, or at least how we should. Then you go to Isaiah 49, and this unbelievable, I don't want this to be like normal to you and I, because this is God. We just read Psalm 47, he's king over all the earth, he has full authority, full control, creator of heaven and earth. He made everything in the world, everything you see, the galaxies, the stars, the moon, the sun, the axis of earth, how it rotates. I mean, it's unbelievable. But yet, how does he have compassion on us? Isaiah 49, verse 13 through 15. <clears throat> it says, shout for joy, you heavens. Rejoice, you earth, burst into song, you mountains. For the Lord comforts his people and he will have what? Compassion on his afflicted ones. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Then he says, verse 15, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? 
though she may forget, I will never forget you. You need to hear that this morning because I don't know what's going on in your life. Sickness, loss of loved ones, anxiousness, fears, overwhelmed, sad, maybe even depressed, maybe struggling with your past, maybe not a lot of hope for your future, maybe your marriage is struggling, maybe things with the kids aren't going as well as you want to. It's easy to put a smiling face on when you walk into this room, but there is a void, there's a hurt, there's something missing. Maybe all of us in the room, if we just were honest, we would say, there is some struggles going on in my life. But God has not forgotten you. If you, as Elle, this beautiful seven-year-old has just done, going through the books, we vet these young people and make sure they understand what they're committing to. Beautiful to see a father baptizing his daughter, calling her best friend. I mean, that is absolutely wonderful. But she has now cemented the fact that for the rest of her life and for all of eternity, she is a daughter of the king of the earth. Amen? She just got adopted. She just got taken in by God because of Jesus, because of a family and a church that's poured into her, and parents that love Jesus. She is a daughter of the king. And to you, Christian in the room and watching at home, you are a son or a daughter of God. And I don't know how you see God right now. Where's your relationship with God? Or maybe you felt like he's not done something or missed something for you and you have a certain view of your God right now. And that relationship just does not seem to be at a close place that you would like it to be. Maybe spiritually you don't feel healthy, but God has spoken from the Old Testament on. He proved it in Jesus and we'll talk about that as the series goes on. He adopted you and claimed you as his own. You are not forgotten. You are not alone in your struggles or in your difficulties. He is with you. And so again, man, our circumstances change and alter our view of God so quickly. But that's why the Bible is so important. Long ago with Israel who rebelled and rebelled and rebelled and turned their back against him. God's patience and loving kindness with the people that rejected him the most. He keeps saying through the prophets, I love you. My compassion and my grace is here for you. And it's the same for you and I. Write this down if you're taking notes. Despite our sin and rebellion, God chooses to show compassion to you and I. And I don't know if you think about that very often. I don't know if that crosses your mind too much or if that is something that you feel. I wanna give you five ways. This is so practical and it's a starting point for us to think about the idea of compassion. Five ways God shows his compassion. Number one, is through answered prayer. How many of you can honestly say that God has answered prayer in your life? Please raise your hand if it's happened. Just look at the room. So many of us. Now, this is just how simple I think about it, all right? We're talking about God, okay? He made billions and billions and billions of human beings, right? I mean, just think about the load that he has to deal with, okay? We get all stressed about politics. He sees everything behind closed doors. Like he sees the worst of humanity. He sees it all. Billions of people, galaxies, planets, solar systems. And he is a God that has figured out a way through Christ, through the Holy Spirit to intimately be connected with each and every one of us that he is willing to take the time to answer our little prayers individually. Is that not incredible? The baby likes it, right? Is that not just, we take it for granted, don't we? It's like, yeah, two years ago, God did that, but you know, what's next? But you have a God 
who is above all, who could do anything with his power. And yet he says, my door is open to you. Bring everything you have. Requests, your praises, your needs, your goals, your dreams. Bring all of it to me and according to my will, I will provide for you. Just this couple of weeks ago, God just shows up at our front door and blesses our family in such a profound way. And we just, Heather and I, we come together. There was tears in this situation and just such a surprise and it's just an amazing thing happened. And we're just like, God is so faithful in how he shows up and how he chooses to love us as his children. We don't get everything we want, but one answered prayer to me of seven out of seven billion or whatever it is in the world, God loves me that way. And he listens to me in my quiet time with him despite my sin and rebellion. It's unbelievable who this God is. Don't take him for granted. Worship him for how good he is. He doesn't have to do any of that, but he chooses to because he's a good father. Number two, God gives us wisdom. I love what James says. He said, if you choose to ask God for wisdom and you believe that you will receive it, God's gonna bless you with wisdom. You guys are making decisions all the time for your life, for your family, for your marriage, for your future, with your money, with all kinds of things. Why wouldn't you go to the God of all wisdom and say, God, what do you think? <laughs> what do you want for my life? I've surrendered my life to you. If I, I can trust you with my eternal life and salvation, why wouldn't I trust you with, with this life that's meant to be for you anyways? And so God, again, in his brilliance through the spirit of God, that's why I talk about it so much, you have to learn how to work with the spirit. The way Paul talks about it, you walk in step with the spirit and he reminds you of truth and he wants to show you the way, first of all, so you don't do anything dumb and outside of God's will, but also so that you walk into his blessings. You stay the course and stay on the track that God has in front of you. He blesses us with wisdom. The third one is healing. I preached on this a while ago, but why wouldn't we go to God when you're emotionally in pain and ask him to heal your heart? Why wouldn't that be the first place you go to? This God who is so intimately involved in your life and we get heartbroken or we struggle with something and we're sad and we're dealing with those things. Why wouldn't we go to the father that knows every inch of our, our being and every thought we have and every fear we have and say, God, bring peace into my emotional struggles in my life. Why wouldn't we pray for physical healing for God to just lay his hand upon us as the great physician? He may not choose to do it. There may be a purpose in the pain, but man, Jesus was healing all over the place. Why wouldn't we, we ask for it? Some of you have been hurt by churches. There's spiritual healing that needs to happen. God, help my eyes be focused on you, not the people that are gonna let me down. Do you pray for healing all throughout the Bible, mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually? God is putting people's pieces back together. It's offered to us. We have to seek it. Number four is forgiveness. Number four is forgiveness. If you read the Bible front to back, you just see how patient this God is as a, as a dad who loves his children. It's like the prodigal son just all throughout the Old Testament. And God made a decision that he would send his son he would send us Jesus into the world and he would gather up all the sins of the world, past, present, and future, and he would lay that punishment upon Christ so you and I would be free from it. How does he show compassion to me? He saw my sin and he gave up Jesus for me. Man, there's no greater sign of compassion 
for someone else to take the pain and suffering that I deserved onto themselves and they don't deserve it. Man, that's enough for God to prove that he loves you, that he's secure in his pursuit of you and his love for you and his desire for you to be with him and close to him, to not turn away from him, to worship him, to serve him, to join his mission, to join what he has in store for you. You have been forgiven for everything you have done and will ever do. It's incredible. We have trouble forgiving people all the time because we get hurt. We take it personal. We don't like that feeling. So what does God do when we hurt him? He takes the pain on himself. And he says, I forgive you and I love you. I wanna help you live a life that I've called you to, a life of blessing, a life free from the enemy of kicking balls in girls' faces and hurting people, right? Just, I'm, I want better for you and your future for your life. He's so kind and patient. Will he hold you accountable? Yes. Will he have judgment? Yes. But we live in the time of grace. We're not sacrificing animals and shedding blood for forgiveness. Christ, the perfect lamb of God, already did it for you and I. You are forgiven, amen? You are forgiven. You are forgiven by this God. Finally, number five ties into that. He suffered for us. And I just want to make that point so clear. We already took communion and remembered the body and the blood of Jesus, but you cannot take for granted what happened over 2,000 years ago on the cross. The pain inflicted on Jesus was so severe dying of suffocation on a cross, shedding his blood, whipped, beaten, mocked, spit on. He was perfect. And at any moment, he could have brought the power of heaven to earth to just wipe out all the Romans and take over the scene. But he said, I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to be the Christ that was spoken of in the Old Testament. I'm gonna be the one to suffer for all of those people who need forgiveness and love. Do you believe we have a compassionate God? He loves you deeply. So what is our response to it? How do we respond? Well, John, all the way back in the Bible, 1 John, when he's older and kind of writing his last letters to the church, he says in chapter three, <coughs> this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or a sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? He's asking the question, if you've been provided for spiritually for all of eternity, how can you turn down as a Christian? opportunities to love people right in front of you physically. And then he says this really powerful thing. He says, dear children, verse 18, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. In other words, John is saying the time for talking about being a Christian is over. It's time to get to work. It's time to love people. It's time to pass on the love of Jesus to this dying and broken world, to see the compassion of God from heaven to earth through those who are convinced they've been saved. You and I are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. And we get to go into the world, your workplace, your neighborhoods, your families, your friends, the people you come across and show what the compassion of God looks like because we take it from him and we find ways to disperse it to the world around us so that the name of Jesus will be praised. And I wanna be that kind of church that doesn't just say what we believe and who we are, 
but rises to the occasions and steps up to the opportunities in front of us to show the love of God to the people around us. So right now, we have the compassion packets as this very real, tangible opportunity. I want you to pray about that. I want you to consider getting your children involved and writing letters to these kids and praying for them and exchanging pictures and building a relationship through this bridge that Compassion International has created. So the love of God goes to the ends of the earth. And I think we can help change a lot of lives. Why don't you stand as we close and as we dismiss this morning, prayer partners will come up if you need prayer, if you wanna be poured into this morning, but let's pray. Father, today we say thank you for your compassion. We see you as the God that you have displayed in the Bible, but we've also seen it in our lives. You provide for us. You care for us. You're patient with us. You give wisdom, discernment, direction. You change our course. You help us make wise decisions. But God, ultimately you've forgiven us and you suffered for us on the cross. Thank you that you are a compassionate God to us. You are a father who loves his children. And may we, as your children, go into the world pass on that amazing love that you have given to us. What a privilege it is to worship you, to serve you, and to live for you. Thank you for this church. and Thank you for all the impact we get to make in your name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.